Hello, my name is Jose Wilson, and I really want to think about today how we can all get better at our math education, specifically how we can make it so everyone can learn math in a really profound way. And so when I think about my own education, I do remember how I used to get A's in pretty much everything I did when it came to mathematics. Uh, I used to get A's from pre-K all the way to third grade. And in fact, it was so wild that they often uh, tried to skip me grades. So I was getting A's all throughout third grade, all throughout fourth grade. Um, even when I wasn't doing homework, I just kept getting A's and A's and A's. And um, it was such a wonderful experience when I was in the math classroom because it was just so easy for me. It came naturally. Um, and it was so wild when I was going through seventh and eighth grade. In fact, I was throwing up A's. I was literally like, just wow! I could just get A's all any time I wanted, whenever I wanted, however I wanted, and that felt really good for me as a math student. But then somewhere down the line, I really started to see that I wasn't as competent in math as I thought. And one of the ways that that came up was. Um, in ninth grade when I tried to get into a, a Regents-based class and they told me that I couldn't. So I was already nervous by then. And then by the time I got to 11th grade, I was really just sad. I, I didn't know what to do with myself. And oftentimes I felt like, why am I here? Why am I actually in class doing math? So by the time that I got even into um, senior year of high school, I was trying to do calculus and I was in honors classes trying to do my best. I was like, no, please, I can't do this anymore. I was just so nervous about being a math student. And so I wonder how that translates for kids who, I guess, consider themselves gifted. I mean, we are just so stressed out every so often because we feel like, wow, this math may not be for me. And that's really where the nervousness comes from. And lo and behold, I became a teacher of mathematics. It was kind of a weird thing for me to fess up to because I kind of felt nervous at the end there, but one of the few things I do know about is how to teach math better and how specifically to make myself a better teacher for all students. So when I think about myself in the math classroom, I'm always trying to give them the best because you really don't know the gifts that they possess. As a matter of fact, most of us really don't consider the gifts that we have currently. Uh, and in case you haven't heard, there's a few things that we do know about math teachers. One is that teachers of color are more likely to think their students are gifted. They're more likely to look at their students as uh, very, very well smart, but also that too often we center ourselves in the mathematics and not our students. So a solution I can think about is the words of Bob Moses where he says illiteracy in math is acceptable in the way that Ill illiteracy in reading and writing is unacceptable. So we have to democratize algebra in a really concrete way. Uh, one of the things that I think about when I do teach is I try to open as many doors as possible for my students. And th those keys are so critical for my students anytime at all times. Uh, they need to be able to get into these doors that are often close to them. And so when I think about people who like want to pontificate on whether we should be teaching kids higher level math, I often laugh because they would never accept that for their own children and yet they accept it for our children. I don't know how I feel about any of that. Uh, something that I want to consider is how do we treat math like literacy? Do we treat it as something that is just about jobs or is it about the enjoyment of actually doing the math itself? Um, I also want to throw in on your laps how see, we often look at students as needing to own their math and we don't often get to do that. They need to own their math in a really profound way. Um, and also, we have to worry about this issue of relevance and if, whether or not it's real world. When the math is actually interesting, it doesn't actually have to apply to the real world. That's what I found with a lot of my students. They'll just say, hey, this is really interesting math and that's perfectly okay. It doesn't need to be real world or whatever have you. Because really, when I look at my students, I say, do they uh, have the fullest potential possible? Are they demonstrating that they know the math? And if they do, then good for them because all of them deserve the best math possible. And if you don't believe that, then... <laughs> anyway, thank you. All right, next up, next in the ring is Amy, Amy Lucenta. Amy currently works as a secondary mathematics clinical teacher educator for the Boston Teacher Residency Program. She works with districts and educational collaborative organizations as they transition 
their curriculum and pedagogy toward full implementation of the Common Core state standards. Amy is a previous middle school and high school teacher and has served as an elementary math coach, aligning and writing district curriculum, designing and delivering district-based professional development, as well as job-embedded individualized coaching. She is co-authoring a forthcoming book to be published by Heinemann, Routines for Reasoning, Fostering the Mathematical Practices in All Students. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you Amy. The math practices, are they an essential goal for all students, or are they a critical support for struggling learners? That's the question we're going to explore together in the next four minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> Our goal is to develop the math practices in all students, and uh, that may be an uphill climb for some of our students. In fact, it may be a steep uphill climb for some of our students. If we're not careful, we can teach the math practices and lose students along the way, and wind up teaching the math practices to a select group of students who make it to the summit mathematical thinking and reasoning. That's because math practices require students to think in certain ways and to take certain actions, creating what could be considered stumbling blocks along the climb. The math practices require that students work within contexts, and that could be challenging for kids, particularly for struggling readers who are working to comprehend the problem context. The math practices require students also to communicate ideas, and that could be a challenge for a lot of students, particularly for English language learners, for whom both the mathematics and the language are new. The math practices also require students to connect ideas and representations, and that could be a challenge for a lot of students. And a particular challenge for students who see mathematics as a series of disconnected topics and procedures. And finally, the math practices require students to abstract and generalize. Again, a challenge for a lot of students, particularly for students with conceptual processing weaknesses or who struggle to persevere. It's overwhelming. A nightmare! <laughs> If we leave English language learners, struggling readers, those with conceptual processing weaknesses, if we leave all those students behind, I'm in a cold sweat. However, rest easy, the future's <laughs> bright. Those same actions that could be considered challenges also align with research-based best practices for struggling learners. Let's take a look at some of those supports Working within context supports students. Assigning context like quarters when you're multiplying by 25 is helpful for kids. Let's bring all students to the sun. Context supports students if they're meaningful and relevant, like iTunes downloads or local sports statistics. Makes the language accessible and the mathematics, therefore, accessible. Let's bring all students to the sun. Communicating ideas is a support for students. Self-talk and turn-in talks provide uh, opportunities to verbalize ideas. <clears throat> Let's bring all students to the summit. Communicating ideas supports auditory learners as they refine and, and develop precision, share out, and record ideas. Let's bring, you got it, all students to the summit. Connecting ideas and representations supports learners as they internalize abstract ideas. Developing the sense that math is interconnected and it makes sense. Let's bring all students to the summit. We know visuals connect ideas and language, therefore supporting English language learners. Let's bring all students to the summit. Abstracting and generalizing is a support if we have options to get there. The math practices describe three avenues of thinking 
to abstract and generalize, quantitative, structural, and repetition. Let's bring all, all students to the sun. <laughs> try one avenue, try the second, and yet try the third. That's what builds perseverance in students. Let's bring all, all students, students to the sun. sun. It's a symbiotic relationship. If we teach the practices authentically, we'll be supporting special populations. And if we support special populations with integrity, we'll be teaching the practices. All together, let's bring all students to the sun. The math practices are an essential goal for all students and a critical support for struggling learners. Teach the practices.
Okay, here's one more. So in the next three and a half minutes, I'm going to share six lessons I learned on the road to becoming an 83 percenter. <laughs> the first lesson I learned was that before I even ask a question in class, I need to put the time and the work in up front. It has to be done at that kidney table at the back of the classroom. I need to spend the time planning. I need to be able to anticipate students' responses. Because when I ask better questions, Students can't respond with a simple yes or a simple no. And these are the questions that we really want to try and get at each and every day in our classroom. See, I begin to ask questions like, what if, should you, uh, could you, 
These have become the Frank's hot sauce of my questions. I put that shit on every single spoon. So when we ask questions that aren't answered with yes and a no, I begin to, I'm, I'm allowed to begin to answer questions and listen to students' answers, listen to their responses, but not listen for their answers. If this gives you a headache, you probably need Max Ray's Ignite Talk. The third lesson I learned was that I just need to keep my mouth closed. I don't need to clarify. I don't need to always rephrase. I don't need, always need to tell students what I think that they're thinking. See, I have this little voice in my head that's now continually telling me, yo, Fletch, zip it. <laughs> and you know what? That's good, I like that voice, I need that voice, because that voice has brought me to lesson number four, which is really hard. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> that is so painful. But you know what that pain that we endure in class, you know what that tells students? It tells students that we believe in them. It tells them that, hey, what you have to say is far more important than anything that I could ever say. When you stand in a classroom, where do you stand? Do you stand at the front of the class? Do you stand at the back of the class? Is it looking at the boogers on the bottom of the kidney table in a kindergarten classroom? These are things. Because what I found is where I stand in the classroom predicts a lot about the types of questions I ask my students. When I ask questions from the front of the class, they're far less effective than when I ask them around students and when I'm sat by them at, on a knee next to their desk. See, when I'm next to students, I'm able to talk a heck of a lot less, and I'm able to listen a heck of a lot more. And in math class, we need to get our students talking more, and we need to do a better job listening more. So this brings me, brings me to my sixth and final lesson that I learned on this, this journey of mine. All I've done is begin to ask questions whenever possible. I try not to ask those other three types of sentences. Because when I ask questions, I found that I'm talking less. And when I talk less, students actually listen more. Mind-blowing for me. It really, truly was. So I challenge you, as you walk out here and back to your districts next week, choose your words, choose your sentences carefully. Otherwise, you could end up sounding like the teacher, Miss Donovan. And if you don't know who Miss Donovan is, just ask Charlie Brown. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next up on the stage, Aaron Igo. As when I go to the that place that's upstairs where you get the food refreshments. <laughs> Aaron has been working in Colonial School District for the past nine years. She taught sixth grade math and science for five years, transitioned to be the building math coach for two years, and for the past two years, she has been a district instructional coach. She has been happily married for eight years and has two beautiful red-headed girls. Me too. Ladies and gentlemen, Aww. I give to you Aaron. <laughs> On February 26, 2010, I received an email with this message attached. At that time, I was a classroom teacher, trying to get my students to talk to each other, and it just was not happening. I was getting so frustrated. For so long, I had created amazing lessons, trying to engage and motivate students to learn. I was working my tail end off every day, creating elaborate PowerPoints, posters, projects, and projects for my students to complete. I was tired of the Oscar award-winning performance every single day. <laughs> I wanted a change. My students needed a change. I wanted my students to do the cognitive lifting. So my quest began, and through it all, I had to remember to have patience. But what really is patience? Here's an example of one person's opinion about patience. Take your time and let go. Take our time. 
That is nearly impossible when we are judged by our performance every school year and is always pressured to finish on top. But quitting was never an option for me. <clears throat> so I began seeking out all types of learning opportunities, started with workshops in my district, which led to collaborating with fellow educators across the country. My objective was to soak up as much information as possible. What did I learn? I learned to listen to my students and adjust instruction, my questioning techniques and how I assess them over time and with patience. My students were engaging in mathematical conversations that became the norm in my classroom. Woohoo, success. Patience is not passive. On the contrary, it is active. It is a concentrated strength. I needed all the concentrated strength I could muster for my youngest daughter, Abigail. Are you <laughs> I, think, I think her expression says it all. Honoring. She never crawled. She really tried my patience. Now, she did it her way. We called it the butt scoop. <laughs> and in my mind, the sequence is, you crawl, then you walk. Oh my goodness, I was so worried that I was failing her that she would never learn how to walk. But, of course she did. She walked, and in fact, she walked quicker than anticipated. My impatience had no effect on Abby's performance, and it still doesn't to this day. Racing to, ra racing to red heads is a roller coaster ride. Caitlin, who is my oldest, who is just like me, a perfect princess. <laughs> While Abby being exactly like her daddy, stubborn and very opinionated, but also <laughs> hilarious. Now, Caitlin, my oldest, imparted wisdom that she learned from Blue's Clues, and at those moments she would say, Mommy, stop, breathe, and think. And even to this day, she always reminds me of that statement. Wow, even my daughter is telling me to have patience. I realized I was worried about my own agenda, that things weren't being done my way. I was listening to my needs and not theirs. As my coworkers know, I am a very reflective and analytical person, always looking for solutions and trying to find parallels in everything. I, I like being able to to use something I learned from situations at home and apply them to work and vice versa. This quote validated my thoughts about patience. Having patience is not a one and done skill. It is constantly changing with every new experience. Patience is extremely important in my role as an instructional coach. Coaching, it is not a simple technique. You are not there to fix problems or to dictate solutions. Rather, you are listening to teachers and asking them questions to employ reflective thinking, thus creating opportunities for learning and change to take place. Trying to define patience for myself, I wanted to combine all of my experiences from what my daughter has been saying with influences from my district and fellow co-workers across the country. So the next time that you feel your heart racing, your blood boiling, remember, stop, breathe, think, and never, ever, ever stop listening. Graduate degree in math from MIT 
a master's degree in mathematics and teaching mathematics from the University of Illinois. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you Dan. Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for being here. I want to talk about a very specific problem, which is this. Low-income students are about half as likely to graduate college with a STEM degree as are middle-class and more affluent students. And this is a problem that doesn't even fully take into account the situation because that stat doesn't distinguish between associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees. It doesn't look at the quality of the institution that the students went to. It doesn't look at the difference between a nursing degree and someone going to med school. And the thing is that low-income students and black and Latino students are just as likely to want to pursue STEM, but somehow we aren't giving them the preparation to be successful when they get to the college level. And the mathematics they encounter is stopping them somewhere. So I want to look at this. We usually look at this through the lens of test scores or something like that, but I want to look at it through a different lens. We're going to look at the slides from the Gateway Physics major course at the University of Michigan, a freshman course, and I want you to think about what kind of knowledge a student needs to understand these slides. So for example, this is just like, a, from the professor's perspective, a fuzzy intro slide, but half the class is going to recognize a particle accelerator. Half of the class isn't, and it's just going to see some random picture there. But already there's a difference being formed. Look at this slide here, look at the language on it. Mechanics is the study of macroscopic motion. Kinematics, dynamics, look at the way that's structured. If students don't have experience interpreting that kind of language, that very sophisticated language, that's going to be really hard. This is a homework problem from a freshman year calculus class. Look at how involved, I mean, don't try to read it. Look at how involved it is. It talks about GPS systems too. If students don't have experience navigating questions of that difficulty and complexity, again, a huge difference. Most of us think of education as a line. You go to elementary school, you go to middle school, you go to high school, and then you go to college. But for students who are very successful in STEM degrees, that's not actually how it is. For them, they do robotics contests, they do independent research and reading, and they go to advanced study summer programs, and they do all of these things that prepares them for another level of thinking. And I want you to imagine being a student from a low-income community who doesn't have this kind of background, goes to colleges in the same classes, and has, to, and, has to, and has to get a grade in that class. There's a big difference between college ready, doing well in your high school classes, and STEM college ready. And we need to think about how we can redesign the system so that all of our students can be exposed to this ecosystem of opportunities so that they can enter into a STEM college ready level, so that they can be ready to think on the level that college requires. And we want the students who love it to be able to go there, basically. So I'm gonna tell you that this is possible. This is happening in a few programs around the country. Um, our program works with the lowest income middle schools in New York City. We have 36 partner schools. The students come to us for the summer and they're studying number theory, combinatorics, graph theory, incidence, geometry. This is in seventh grade. Programming, astrophysics, and then we work with the students to transition them to that ecosystem, to other programs for advanced study, because that's what's going to prepare them to go into STEM and to be really successful there. So, taking a step back, I want to think about four action items you can take back to think about how to help your students be STEM college ready, how to help them be ready for what happens when they get to college. The first thing I want to tell you is just help them pursue their passions. Help them go beyond. Help them find YouTube videos about what they're interested in, apply to summer programs, do their own reading or science fair projects or anything, because they love it and that will prepare them. <laughs> Rise above minimum benchmarks. Assessment right now is all about minimum benchmarks. That's not what it should be. It should be about helping each student find the most challenge that they can find. Encourage your students to go beyond and to find that challenge and to push themselves. They'll like it more. Connect them with other opportunities. These programs out there, many of them have scholarships, many of them are free. They're in all different communities. They're engineers and professors who want to give back. Find them these opportunities to connect and go beyond when the fixed curriculum can't do that for you. And finally, create a community. It matters so much to know that there are others like, others 
out there like you who love this stuff. Make a math club, make a robotics team, make a place in the school where they can find each other and get them out there, help them go beyond. Because we've all had that student who's ready for more and we're like, they'll be fine. But the truth is that when they get to college, they'll need to have done more and you want to push them to do that. I want, I want to invite you to get in touch with me if you want to talk about this further. I'm happy to provide more ideas if I have sparked an interest in you. Thank you very much. Next up, Kristen. Kristen Gray. Kristen is a Yep, go on. Woo woo. Give it up for her. Give it up for Kristen. Kristen is a national, serve, national board certified math specialist at Richard A. Shields Elementary School in the Cape. Hello. 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 She feels fortunate to work with a teaching channel and illustrative mathematics. She loves blogging and collaborating with colleagues, both in person and online, at the Mad Twitter's blog sphere. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you Kristen. I'm interested in this mistake. It was supposed to be a 20, but I, t I told Katie um, there aren't 20 on that plate. Are we as invested in our teachers as learners? Do we create a culture of learning for teachers in our schools? Do they feel safe to make mistakes? Do they collaborate and learn with one another? Are they as comfortable as a student would be reflecting in a journal about their own practice as students reflect about their learning, saying, I'm unsure because sometimes I don't get it, and I'll try my best with fractions. Hmm. I would venture to guess that a teacher would not be this open. So this year, when I moved into the math specialist position and began working part-time for the teaching channel, we had a project around the theme of getting better together. And I thought about Elham's talks about the math labs and the great stuff they're doing at the University of Washington. And the reading specialist and I at my building sat down and restructured our PLCs to be learning labs. It's a cycle of planning, teaching, reflecting that has become a huge culture shift in our building. And under Elham's advice, I sat with each team and the first thing we did was establish norms together. Norms for working together, norms for how we do math together, norms for how we would be in one another's classroom. And each grade level was different because it was based on them. We wanted to create that culture. And then we went through this cycle, beginning with learning math together. We read books about how students learn mathematics. We looked at articles, connected them to the standards, the progressions, and looked at that through the lens of how our curriculum was addressing it. And then we thought about how students learn math, and then we looked at student work to see how our students were doing the math. We took formative assessments and really sat and thought about where our students were on this progression and how we can help them where they most need it. And then probably my favorite is we sat and we did math together. So we did routines and we did tasks and we just did math. We did it as teachers, we did it as students, thinking about instructional decisions and anticipating student responses based on those decisions. And that's all of the things we need to sit and plan an activity together with a five practices structure. We started with the mathematical goal, we anticipated responses, thought about what questions we would ask, how we would sequence and share and make those connections explicit for students. 
A teacher then volunteers to teach the lesson that we planned while all of us sit in the classroom with and amongst the students. We can pause instruction in real time and talk about what we've seen happening. And then we reflect with one another. And the best thing is we're not reflecting about what one teacher saw in their classroom. We're reflecting about what we all just saw in the classroom. So we have specific evidence that we all now have been a part of. And we'd be remiss not to reflect on the process. Here are two reflections from teachers followed by a reflection from my principal. Before, when we had PLCs and be kind of in the back or maybe not involved, this is the most involved and the most excited I've seen teachers. I think it's the most relevant piece of learning that we've done. So I've noticed and wondered a lot of things through these reflections. I've noticed that teaching can feel isolated, but teachers get excited about learning together and they love it. And I wonder why we don't spend more time on this journey creating a culture of learning in our building where teachers are excited about what they're teaching. You didn't make it feel like when you were coming in or when someone else was coming in that it was something we needed to improve upon. It was a journey we were taking together. And this is an exciting journey that needs a revision along the way and I feel like it's probably never ending. But it's a journey worth taking when a teacher can sit and write, I'm unsure because sometimes I don't get it but I'm gonna try my best to learn it. And when teachers can do that, we've established a culture of learning with our teachers in schools. Thank you. The only one who visits is the principal, maybe once a year, to do an evaluation. So I go to one of the principals in the project. I say, so have you thought of having the teachers visit each other's classes? And she says, you know, I went to the Marzano workshop, and I read the book, and so I get it, but I'm relatively new around here, and I can't impose that on my teachers. Hmm. So teaching's more private, it's a bit more vulnerable. So I'm thinking about an article, an article in the New Yorker some years ago by Atul Gawande, where he's comparing sports and singing coaching to instructional coaching for teachers. I was really excited by that article. I decided I'm gonna do my own research. So I start with a basketball coach. His name is Rick Lewis. He coaches pro basketball players who are just below the NBA. I ask him, so Rick, are your guys vulnerable? Arjun, very vulnerable. They all want to be in the NBA. They're not making a lot of money. My main job is to nurture them really out. He gives an example. We're down 18 points in the championship game. We've got to switch to a zone defense. And we use agreed upon strategies. That's how I nurture them. And we win the championship. In fact, he says, they win the championship every year, which is why people like Steph Curry, the best player on the best team in the world in this building right now, why he plays with Rick's team in the summers to hone his skills. Agreed upon strategy. In fact, Rick tells me about a young guy Rick was coaching. His name is Chris DeMarco. Now, here's the deal. Chris realized he wouldn't be an NBA star, so he goes into business and he learns video editing skills, and he volunteers his time with the Warriors. He wants to help. Then, he gets a paying gig as a coach for the Warriors. He actually works in this building, 
And he's got a championship ring of how? Because he gives actionable feedback to the athletes that helps them to improve their practice. So my research goes on now to singing, and I visit with Katie Gathorn. Katie Gathorn is a wonderful singing coach. She and her colleagues coach singers at all different levels. And I asked Katie, so are singers vulnerable? She says, aren't you? So many singers have self-doubt. She reminds me of her colleague, Seth Riggs. She says, when Seth coaches Barbara Streisand, Barbara's famous for her stage fright. Michael Jackson used to call Seth as many as four times a day when he was on the road. And then Katie talks about her own clients. She talks about the people she coached. She says, like, for instance, there's a band called the Stone Foxes. He had a vocal polyp. Death Angel, the guy blew out his vocal cords before the Japanese tour. So what does Katie do? She shares agreed upon te techniques with them, and I know some of them because I know Katie, she's my coach. So we're gonna do a Rolling Stones song, you're gonna clap, I'm gonna bubble. <laughs> between the basketball and the singing and the teaching. And the biggest difference is that teaching is more private. Hmm. But you know, I realize we can help each other by being more public. That's the big thing. Make the practice more public. Now listen, we gotta be sensitive and respectful. Teaching has been maligned for years. So we have to band together as educators and really help one another in our public practice. And we can do it. And here's why we can do it because we agree on the standards, on the strategies. We agree on the mathematical practices. We agree on the math talks. We agree on the rich discourse, on the rich math tasks. We're all wanting to sing the same tune. So here's what I say. Let's go ahead and sing the tune, the Rolling Stones tune. Let's do it together. Now you may think, wait a minute, my voice isn't that great, or I don't know the words, but I'm here to say, if we do this together one time through and nail it, it's gonna sound good, guaranteed. So here we go, you guys ready? And words are coming. Well, we all need to someone we can lean on, join in. And if you want it, well, you can lean on me. So, here's what I say. There's another slide that's supposed to be up there, but just skip through. And what I'm going to say is this. Let's make our practice public. Let's do it together. Make teaching more public. Let's lean on each other together. Lean on. Some time away from me, and I loved it. I was super happy there. It was great. 
When I was little, I was so jealous of my brother going off to school and leaving me at home with mom, boring mom. And uh, so when I, the first day of kindergarten, I was super excited to go and meet my teacher. My mom was excited too, but for different reasons. <laughs> Miss Trimble, first grade. Oh my God, she gave me my love and passion for learning. I just adored that woman. And that's when I decided I wanted to be a teacher. Wanted to do it forever, and here I still am. I've had some amazing teachers in my educational career. Here's one of them, whom I've seen him earlier this week, Dr. Randy Charles, who took every class I could from him at San Jose State, and he ignited my passion for mathematics. And I try to pass that passion on to my students still to this day. Uh, he's an amazing guy, and he taught me about going to the Silmar Math Conference. If you know me, you know how passionate I'm about that conference. It's the first guy that got me to go. I have time. Got my first teaching job. So excited to decorate my classroom and plan and meet my new students. I was over the moon over this. And they were hard, let me tell you, but they were exciting. And I love them to death. Still remember them to this day. It gives me a little emotional. <laughs> I still get excited about meeting my new students every year. I remember at that time that I would go home and I was exhausted. And then I'd wake up the next day all fired up and ready to do it again. I still feel that way today. The other reason I wake up every single day and go back up. Oh, sorry. Am I feeling sorry? I mean, these kids are just amazing. I'm going to tell you some of the funny and awesome things that they do to make me love being in the classroom. <laughs> a sign in my classroom, I give a to F. If everybody passes a test with a C minus or higher, they get a popcorn party. So this kid was walking in and smelling remnants of a popcorn party. My kids love this sign in my classroom. All right, here we go. I'm going to try to do this. Dear Mrs. Orca, we got you a small gift for your birthday, but it was incomparable to the gift that you give us every day. You're an amazing teacher, giving us wonderful advice on our projects to help them run smoothly. Though you are very busy, you always find the time for us, helping to improve project plans, planning fun activities in class. I get my motivation, my inspiration, enthusiasm, and encouragement all from you. Happy birthday, Mrs. Orca. You inspire me to be a better person every day. How can you deal? I mean, what job do you do? Okay, so last year's been hard. My dad was really ill. I would try to, you know, get through my day anyway and try to kind of keep that as separate, but it's hard. Sometimes it would just creep on in, and I would tell my students, you know, if I was having a bad day. So one day, the student, oh, the picture doesn't show up. Yes, you bet that right. She walked away from her boyfriend to come across campus to ask me how I was doing, and it just showed me that she cared about, you know, me as a person and not just as her teacher. Uh, so, unfortunately, my dad passed away. My colleague and I, our dads passed within two weeks of each other. So we sat our class down, and we talked outside in a circle. And we just shared what was going on with us. And let me tell you, they shared right back to us. It was a really amazing bonding experience. Cleaners, anybody, cleaners. Oh my gosh. But it brought us closer together, and that is that humanity, right? I mean, I just can't imagine being They pranked me. April Fool's Day pranked me by putting stuffed animals all over my room. What kind of April Fool's joke was that? It was adorable. Super cute, super sweet. I think they were trying to raise my spirits. Then uh, a few days later it was my birthday and I got hand rolled sushi. They know they don't like it, that I don't like to eat some of that stuff that they eat. And they have sparkling cider on that screen too. <laughs> anyway, in the classroom, I have managed to find all these amazing opportunities to be a leader and stay in the classroom. It is possible. That is for sure. I also get to dress up like a superhero. I get to hurl egg projects off the top of the roof, and I get to wear my jammies to work. It's the best place. I never want to leave it. I'm there forever. Thank you so much.